But I wonder if you're aware of that uh, Winston Churchill himself said, quote, there never was a war more easy to prevent than this war that has, per that has just devastated the world. Mm -hmm. He said it could have easily been prevented without a single shot being fired, and Germany would be a democratic and free country today. And this quote, by the way, was in his Iron Curtain speech, which nobody ever mentioned. <laughs> they mentioned the other parts because it just undermined the whole deal. And what he said was the way that it could have been prevented, he said that after World War I, we had pushed for the League of Nations to create effective, enforceable world law. And if that had happened, we never would have had the Holocaust. We never would have had all those, those people killed. And the amazing, and this is from, from Winston Churchill himself. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, by the way, Arthur Kanagas with one film. And we're producing a film about an amazing guy, another, uh, he, uh, he was a, 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 a another bomber pilot in World War II who was so upset about bombing a city full of civilians, Gary Davis, that he ended up giving up national citizenship, declaring himself a world citizen, and he's been traveling ever since as only a citizen of the world, traveling on his world passport, issuing world passports that have been issued to over almost a million people, two, two million documents altogether, and that have been stamped by almost every nation in the world. And the key thing, that, that, that he has taught me that the biggest secret, biggest secret of, of all, is that humanity has actually already invented a system that completely eliminates war. And that is democratic government. I mean, within the United States, California, you would never think of going to war with no other. You have a system of courts, you have another system of handling. Even when Tim McVeigh blew up the federal building, Oklahoma didn't declare war in Michigan for harboring the Michigan militia. <laughs> it's a criminal justice system right. problem. And what Gary says is that the biggest lie of all is that we are Americans, that we are United States citizens, that we're Cubans, that we're Russians. We're all Globians, Worldians, as, as, as Buckner or Fuller said. And they're not really lines dividing this planet. Those are imaginary. We make them up, we fight and kill people over them. And he says the key thing is for we the people to take back our sovereignty, that we don't have to beg and plead these dysfunctional leaders who, as soon as no matter who, no matter you, who you elect, can't within that dysfunctional system serve the planet because their loyalty is to the part, not the whole. That we now have this amazing tool, the internet, to begin to create wiki government for the planet. The borders are obsolete, mm -hmm. and to begin to cre create a new way that we, the people, take back our planet and create the world we choose. Yay. 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 I think that's very well said, and I think that what Winston Churchill remarked was true, not because even Winston Churchill said it, but, but despite Winston Churchill having said it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, let Elizabeth ask her question. Uh, okay. Hi, my name's Elizabeth Forsyth Haley. I'm here with Ed Fisher representing Interfaith Communities United for Justice and Peace. We're hosting a conference in the spring, and I think feelers have already been put out, PJ, that we want you yes. very much to come back and be our <laughs> keynote speaker. Yeah. Yeah. But my question is, I was disturbed listening to Christiane Amanpour this morning talk oh. about Richard Holbrook oh. and present him as such a peacemaker <laughs> with eight and accords, and his whole campaign was called Bombs for Peace, and yet he was presented as a diplomat, the, the alternative to war, but he bombed them into submission. So, what is your take on that? Don't do not listen to Christian. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, she, yeah, uh, we'll talk about it on Lila's show. Uh, Tomorrow, Richard, Tomorrow, Richard, behind you. Tomorrow, Richard, Tomorrow, Richard, yeah. I, I know there are people shouting behind me and in front of me. Can, should I address the, the questions as they come first, yes. briefly? Okay. So, uh, Richard Holbrook uh, was a servant of the military. Uh, he was a war maker, not a peacemaker. From Vietnam through Afghanistan, through Yugoslavia, through Iraq, uh, Richard Holbrook uh, is someone who openly admitted that we are no more in danger if Al Qaeda is in Afghanistan than if it's in all the other countries it's in, that it's not there now, that it's not on good terms with the Taliban, that the Taliban is not necessarily going to be in power if we leave, and yet would go out and say we have to keep this war going to protect us from uh, Al Qaeda. Uh, on a deathbed, he said we've got to get out of this war. 
Well, Richard, Richard Holbrook's famous last words, uh, you've got to get uh, us out of this war in Afghanistan, as if his, as if his surgeon was going to do what he didn't have the decency to do. And, and, and when the Washington Post says that he was joking, uh, he, he, it certainly would fit much better with everything he did in every other day of his life up until that one, had he been joking. Uh, I have no idea whether he was joking or not, but what's interesting is that the Washington Post would think that they can claim that support for majority opinion had to have obviously been a joke, that anyone saying we should get out of Afghanistan clearly must have been joking. That's the, that's the, bubble, that's the bubble in which the Washington Post and the White House and the elites in Washington operate, despite majority American opinion for getting out. Uh, and, and you can go through Richard Holbrook's uh, crimes in, in East Timor and in Yugoslavia and the rest of it. He is, is a man of war uh, who did not do a thing uh, for peace that I'm aware of uh, in his life. Uh, and uh, people who, there, there was a, a, a diplomat named uh, Chas Freeman who had a position early last year and was roundly uh, expelled from Washington for having uttered a few truths about Israel, uh, who will not be treated this way when he dies. Uh, the diplomats who are treated this way when they die are the ones who succeeded in this system, and they do it uh, by supporting war. But I, I think to speak, uh, just for the idea, I think we've all had loved ones who die, and I know that most of you understand that when they say things on their deathbeds or as they approach, it is good to parse them and ponder them because they are generally um, a good message and something true. And the fact that we've gone so far that a man like Richard Holbrook, who did dedicate his whole life to something that might not have been true, had a reversal or some insight on his deathbed and the fact that our media can say, no, no, he was kidding, and deny that man his dying insight is to me um, an unsacred defiling of the human spirit that will will be answered in some way. I didn't know that. Thank you. I have some. Oh. There's another book. I wonder. I wonder if you cover in your book. The general, I wonder if you cover in your book the general degradation of the caliber of our men folk primarily. You know, I mean, from World War II becoming bikers and after Vietnam becoming druggies and now the depleted uranium and it's creating permanent damage. And I have personal reasons as an acupuncturist, I have a table in there of uh, double CDs for veterans with post traumatic stress, kind of a stress relief meditation. And another version for the rest of us. So we're all post-traumatic stressed out. Yeah. But I just wondered, in other words, this is a, a huge phenomenon of what every war does, right? Back to the Civil War, just the people that come out of it are so ruined, you know, and we're all the, the, the offspring of these creatures. Certainly a lot of uh, space in the book is devoted to what wars do to soldiers and to veterans and what becomes of them and how they are poisoned in many different ways, and to the other 99.5% of the victims of our wars, the, the people on the other side, uh, and what we do to them and their resources and their lands and the huge percentages of some nations that are that are inhabitable due to landmines and, and other poisonings uh, that, uh, you know, that Afghanistan, not too many years back, used to see all kinds of migratory birds going through that just don't go near the place uh, anymore. Uh, we, we destroy the planet and the people in it, uh, including uh, the U.S. soldiers uh, with these wars, and, it's, uh, and, and there are lots of lies about that, and they're in the book, yes. Please don't uh, use their word, you depleted uranium. But use something else, because- David, nuclear waste. two more questions. Yeah. And then a final statement this. from each of you, and then you're going to go sign some more books and sell some more books, okay? Two okay, more two more there. questions, and one of them will be and from a gentleman behind me, uh, and, and one from in front of me, and then, <laughs> and then we'll have uh, final statements. So, yeah, what's your question? Thanks. Um, I'm Michael Haas, uh, the author of the book, George W. Bush, War Criminal. Oh, okay. and, <laughs> 
Well, that book is not for sale at Barnes and Noble or, <laughs> or Borders, but it is for sale in Karachi, in the bookstores oh, yeah. around the world. And I identified in that book 269 war crimes based on provisions of the Geneva and related conventions. And, and when, and so here's my question. My question is, it revolves around the confession of the Times Square bomber when he did his elocution in New York, he said specifically that the reason that he brought a bomb, tried to set up a bomb in Times Square, was because of the killing of innocent civilians in Pakistan by drones. In other words, that war crimes by the United States prompted him yes. to engage in a terrorist act. And so my, my question is, since the American people don't seem to know much about war crimes. The rest of the world does. Is it the case the United States now is deliberately causing war crimes to promote the recruitment of terrorists to attack us? The, uh and Michael's books are, are absolutely wonderful, and you should get them. Uh, and my question to you will be to, to help me uh, with the international bookstores. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I think that here you had in Times Square someone whose father used to guard the nuclear weapons in Pakistan, uh, who is doing everything he can to destroy Times Square. That is a very, very dangerous situation, I think. It is something that's just too close for comfort in, in my view. Uh, and we know what motivates such people. They tell us. We know what motivated the people who flew the airplanes into the buildings. They told us uh, that absolutely nothing could ever excuse such actions, but when we know exactly what creates them and we escalate those very same behaviors in response, uh, I mean, it's the definition of insanity. And uh, I, I think that there are those uh, who want to provoke incidents, who want wars, who, who whether they see it as a grand calculation for greater safety, you know, what, uh, you know, we have to start a war in Korea or so that we can uh, keep our forces there in order to go after China and Russia and, and so forth, or, or whether they are, are out for financial profits, uh, or whether it, it's, it's just irrational war madness uh, it is, is an interesting question. I, I certainly, I have a lot of chapters in the book that look at the lies they tell us about the wars, and then one that looks at the real reasons behind the wars, uh, and many of them are not secret at all, they're just not repeated endlessly in broadcast. Uh, and yet you just can't explain the wars. Uh, you, you have irrational motives of machismo and domination and, and a desire for self-confidence found through bombing populations that just cannot be explained rationally, uh, or, uh, much less by the advertised agenda of, of reducing terrorism uh, through actions that you know will increase terrorism and have increased terrorism. Uh, so I, I, I don't think that the, that the overwhelming agenda is to increase terrorism. I, I think there's just not much interest in decreasing it. Uh, and, and the motives for the wars are largely different. The motives for the wars are to have bases and weapons stationed in places on Earth and to dominate the other nations of the globe and to make the money and to seize the resources and to open the markets and to win the elections and all the rest of the motives that are there for the wars. So uh, I guess that's a long way of saying no. Um, one, is it one more question? One oh, quick no. comment on that to answer Michael's question. Um, the FBI is fully engaged in setting up uh, Muslims to bomb uh, places, uh, as is evident by the fact that uh, they supplied this latest uh, individual with the actual material, even though it wasn't real, uh, to do that. So I, I, I think that it also is very focused on uh, Muslims. Uh, and, and yeah. that, that's part of it. Okay, um, also on oil, 
Uh, one, of the, one of the other things that the Obama administration has done to us <coughs> is nuclear power. And um, they, they have they put $8 billion into the current budget. I'm giving you a heads up because I run the nukefree.org website. And it's right now in front of the Congress where they're going to stuff us with another nuclear plant. Obama did what Bush couldn't do, which is give a loan guarantee to two nuclear plants in Georgia. And this whole goddamn nuclear industry is coming back at us through this Democratic administration.